Well, good morning, church, and welcome to this service of worship for Multnomah Presbyterian Church here in Portland, Oregon. My name is Danny. I'm the pastor of MPC. It's with great joy that I welcome you here today as we gather to give all the glory and all the praise to Christ our Lord. And today is Pentecost Sunday, a really significant day in the life of the church. And if you're tuning in this morning and if you're not familiar with the day of Pentecost, Pentecost is the day that we celebrate the the birthday of the church and the gift of God's Holy Spirit that was poured out upon the disciples long ago in rushing wind and tongues of fire. If there was ever a day to fill the comments section with the fire and birthday emojis, today is the day. We encourage that. Uh, But I once heard someone say that we serve and worship a God who gives to us with both hands. God gives to us with both hands. God gives us the Son, and God gives us the Spirit. So in other words, God gave us everything that he had to give. And one of the ways that we as the church respond to the goodness and grace of God is through our giving. This is part of our worship, and there's two primary ways we're doing that now, either by mail or online. There's a link to that up in the description, and we would love to have you partner with us in this way as we continue to seek to be the hands and feet of Jesus to one another and also to the community. You know, it's been close to three months now since we have been worshiping exclusively online. And I know there's a lot happening right now in the state of Oregon and Multnomah County relative to reopening. And I want to encourage you to keep an eye on your email and also your monthly newsletter for updates from MPC leadership. We have established a task force for our church, a small team of people that will be dealing specifically with these questions about what it looks like for us to resume our in-person meetings and gatherings. And as this process unfolds, uh, we will do all we can to faithfully uh, communicate with you. And just know that um, on behalf of our leaders and our staff as well, um, we long to meet together again. Um, But we also Um, are convinced that we need to do it safely uh, and responsibly. So stay tuned for more information about what that looks like. Uh, But now let's turn our attention uh, to Jesus. And I want to call us into worship with these words from Psalm 104. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. So friends, let us rejoice together as as we continue to worship our Lord.
Hey MPC kids, today we are celebrating Pentecost. Do you remember what Pentecost is? It's that funny name for the birthday of the church, not just MPC, but all churches, because it's the celebration of the day when Jesus gave his friends the Holy Spirit, when Jesus gave that part of God that would be with us always, that person of God who we can't see, but they're always with us so that we don't have to have Jesus in person with us to be loved by him, to be friends with God, or to share Jesus's love with others. And today, the Hellman Pets are going to reenact the story of Pentecost for you as we read it along with them from the Jesus Storybook Bible. Jesus' friends and helpers huddled together in a stuffy upstairs room. Even though it was sunny outside, the shutters were closed. The door was locked. Wait in Jerusalem, Jesus told them. I'm going to send you a special present. God's power is going to come into you. God's Holy Spirit is coming. So there they were waiting. Actually, mostly what they were doing was just being scared and hiding. You can't blame them. Their best friend had left. As they waited, they were praying and remembering how from the beginning God had been working out his secret plan. Suddenly, a strong wind filled the little room, whistling through the walls, rustling the straw on the floor, and there, on everyone's heads, shining in the gloom, were flickering flames, fire that didn't burn or hurt, and something more. Inside their hearts, they felt a strange heat almost as if all the coldness and hardness were melting away, as if their broken hearts were mending, and God was giving them brand new hearts, hearts that could work properly. How it happened, they didn't know, and surged out into the streets as if they had never been afraid. Peter spoke in a loud voice that everyone could hear. Jesus died for you because he loves you, but God made him alive again, and he has rescued you. Stop running away from God, run to him instead, so he can love you. And Peter told them the wonderful story of God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. There were lots of people from faraway countries in Jerusalem. They couldn't speak the same language, but as they listened to the disciples, everyone could understand what Peter was saying in their own languages. Many people believed it became Jesus' new friends and helpers, and the wonderful news of Jesus spread like sparks from a fire. Every day more and more people believed, and so it was that the family of God's children, his special people, grew. This was God's plan. It's such a great story. It's kind of a strange story for parts of it, isn't it? But it's such a great story of God doing crazy things like having flame that doesn't burn and on top of people's heads and a mighty wind and people understanding languages because God wanted to make sure they knew that something was different now that even though Jesus was gone he was still with them and they could still share his love with people even though he wasn't physically there and we may not be physically at the church together but we can still have church can't we we can still celebrate God's love and worship him and thank him for the ways that he's taking care of us right now and we can share that love with others. We might not be able to have VBS this summer and that's a big bummer. I don't remember a summer without VBS ever but we can be the church in our own backyard so maybe you can take some of the things that you love about VBS some of the games and projects and Bible stories and the messages of how much God loves us and you can recreate that for a friend when it's safe to have a friend over you can bring the church to your backyard because it's already there because you're the church because you have God with you. And thanks for being the church this week, everyone, and sending us photos. It's going to be so good to, to see everyone right now and celebrate the church's birthday together. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made Come set our hearts ablaze with hope Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church We need your power in us 
Well, church, thanks again for sending in all those photos. It's so good to see everyone and to be able to celebrate together apart. We're the church no matter where we are. I'm the church in my garage today because it's the only quiet place in my house. And maybe you're having lots of those moments too. But isn't it awesome to know that we can still be the church. We can still be with God. We can still be of use to God. He can show his love through us in our families, in our homes. And now let's turn to him in prayer and ask for some patience as we continue down this road. Lord, we thank you today for your church. We thank you that in the midst of all that we are going through right now, that we can come together and worship you even as we're apart. God, we need patience these days to endure, to continue to be apart from each other, to continue to be with maybe the people in our house. We need patience to open things slowly, to listen to the cautions of the scientists and the governor, to do the things that we need to do to care for each other when we just want to break free. And God, as much as we celebrate too today, we also, our hearts are heavy, not just with this quarantine, but also knowing that it's hard to see that we are the church when we often cannot even recognize that each one of us is created in your image, that each one of us bears you and your spirit. We're tired from all this, but we're so weary from the division all around us, from the brokenness the injustice, Lord. This week, our hearts are heavy as we're confronted with the racism that still is all around us. We lift up the family of George Floyd to you, Lord, and we ask that you would bring them peace and that you would bring justice, that you would bring justice to them, to Minneapolis, to our nation, and to our world. How can we truly bring your kingdom when we allow race, political party, class, and so much more to blind us to the Imago Dei in each of us? Open our eyes to see you in the faces of each other, to see that we are all, each one of us, your beloved children, and let your spirit move through us to bring justice Help your church, help us to be your advocates for the oppressed and your instruments of peace. As your prophet Amos said, Lord, we cry out to you and ask, let justice roll down like mighty waters and let righteousness flow like an ever-flowing stream. We thank you today, Lord, again, that we are not alone, that we have the gift of your spirit and the challenge that brings to us to be the church today. So help us bring light this week. Help us bring peace. Help us bring justice. Help us bring joy. And happy birthday to your church. Amen.
Good morning, MPC. My name is Kate and I'm one of the elders in the church. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 through 27. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of the truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. 
But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, church, it's good for us to be gathered around the word of God today on Pentecost. And thank you to Kate for reading that text for us. And for the people of God, Pentecost is a really big deal. I know Christmas and Easter tend to be kind of the big two of Christian holidays, but then Pentecost kind of gets left out of that mix. Uh, I don't think Hallmark makes any Pentecost cards, um, although if they did, I would totally buy them. But the truth is that if it were not for Pentecost, then we would have never heard about Easter. That if the Holy Spirit had not been poured out upon the church, and if this church had not been equipped to, to take the gospel to the nations, then we would have never known, we would have never heard about God's salvation in Christ. And for us, 2,000 years later, the Holy Spirit is and will continue to be the, the lifeblood of our church. So even as we worship today, as we worship today as a scattered community of faith, we, we are bound together by the power of the Holy Spirit. And for that, we can be grateful in that we can rejoice. But before I uh, go any further, before I get into the John passage, let's uh, join our hearts together in a moment of prayer. Father God, we are grateful uh, for, this, uh, for this day. Lord, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. For Lord, you have done great things. Long ago, you poured out your Holy Spirit in abundance. You gave to us your very self, your very essence, so that we would never walk alone. So God, we ask once more today that you would pour out your Spirit upon us. Pour out your Spirit into our homes and our living rooms, that we might be drawn into a, a deeper relationship, a deeper communion with you. God, we want to know you and, and love you more. And this we ask in the strong name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. So a couple of years ago, I received a, a gift that I, was, that I was really excited about. Somebody gave me one of those DNA testing kits that gives you a, a breakdown based on your DNA of where you come from. And a number of my family members had, had done it, so I was pretty anxious to see you know, what my results would be. So I did it, you know, I sent in my DNA and a few weeks later I got my results. And, and there wasn't really anything surprising on there. As I expected, uh, the test revealed that most of my DNA could be traced to, to two places, uh, to Portugal and to Northeastern Mexico. And I, I started to read about all of the events and all of the circumstances that would have led my family to migrate from these places to Central California. And I found myself really wanting to know more, right? Because it's one thing to know where you come from, but it's another thing to, to really know the stories. You know, I wanted to know what was it like to, to travel across an ocean and, and settle down and make your home in a place that was completely foreign to you? You know, what was it like to leave the place that your family had called home for, for generations? I couldn't help but have this deep sense of curiosity about who my ancestors were. And for us, the, the Church of Jesus Christ, the, the day of Pentecost um, is the day when we remember our spiritual ancestors. And this is what the book of Acts is for us in the New Testament. These are stories of our spiritual ancestors. Yes, our our community, our church, was founded in Multnomah Village in 1920, but we trace our lineage back to Acts chapter 2, the moment in time when God poured out his Holy Spirit on gathered disciples and the church of Jesus Christ was born. So the day of Pentecost is, is our story too, for, for that same spirit is, is living and active in our church and in our lives. But the thing is, the thing is, I think it's sometimes difficult for us to identify and relate to the experiences of our spiritual ancestors in the book of Acts. I'm not sure it's always easy to see the story of Pentecost as being our story too. And for a moment, let's take a look at the, at the story of Acts 2. This is what the scriptures say um, about that day 2,000 years ago. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
And suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So here we have it. This was Pentecost, a violent rushing wind from heaven, tongues of fire resting on each of the disciples. Um, They began to speak in tongues as the Spirit allowed, and by the end of it all, 3,000 people had been added to the church. So so that's the story, and and the book of Acts is filled with stories just like this, of stories of the Holy Spirit showing up in just mind-blowing ways. So church, these are the stories of our spiritual ancestors. And yes, it can be hard to relate because these manifestations of the spirit are perhaps so far beyond our own experiences in following Christ. But we should not make the mistake of thinking the primary work of the spirit is tongues of fire and supernatural healings. Yes, the Spirit d- does do those, those things. I'm convinced of that much. But, but the work of the Spirit, I think, is far bigger and far more expansive than we often realize. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus has a lot to say about this. Jesus has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit. And these words from Christ are deeply relevant and, I think, relatable to us as we seek to follow him and walk in, in the Spirit. So for the last month and a half in worship, we have been hearing God's word from the Gospel of John, chapters 14 through 17, and we're concluding this series today. And as we have seen, Jesus is just pouring out his heart to his disciples, comforting them, trying to assure them that even after he leaves them to go back to the Father, that they'll be okay, that they'll be secure. But if you read these chapters from start to finish, you can see why the disciples are completely confused uh, about what Jesus is telling them. Because Jesus is saying, you know, I'll soon be leaving you, but I will never leave you. And in a little while, you'll see me no more. But then after a little while, I'll be back. And then the world will, will not see me, but you will see me. I mean, listening to all of this, the disciples, you know, had to feel just jostled and disoriented to say the least. But still, several times in this chapter, chapter 14, Jesus tells them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Though Jesus would be leaving them, the disciples could go forth with faith and with courage because the Father would send them another advocate who would be with them forever. Yes, Jesus was leaving, but they would not and would never be alone. And that's the firm and certain promise that we inherit as the church of Jesus Christ. God has given us his spirit, his very essence, so that we will never walk alone. And Jesus is also very clear in these chapters that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not some consolation prize for the disciples. For Jesus even says that that they will be better off after he goes away. Imagine that. Imagine that for a moment. Once Jesus has left them, it will actually be better for these disciples. John 14, verse 12, Jesus says that you will do greater things because I am going to the Father. He comes back to it in chapter 16 when he says this, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. You know, occasionally when I'm reading the stories of Scripture, you know, I'll think to myself, wow, if only I could have seen Jesus face to face. That if only I could have witnessed his miracles, if only I could have heard his teaching for myself, if only I could have seen his resurrected body, then what kind of a faith would I have? But Jesus was very clear here with the 12, it will be better for you after I'm gone and the Spirit comes upon you. So for us, the Holy Spirit is is not something less than, but the real presence of a powerful God. But still, I don't know about you, but, but I have a lot of lingering questions about the Holy Spirit. And one thing that we often wonder is, what does the Holy Spirit 
really do. And in fact, I titled this message that because I think it's a question that we, we've all had before. What does the Holy Spirit really do? And I, I'm grateful that, that here in John 14, Jesus spells out for us two primary ways that the Holy Spirit manifests in the lives of God's people. I want to look once more at verse 26. Jesus says this, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So from Jesus, here we have two ways that the Spirit works in our lives. And I want to take a few moments and kind of unpack these things for us. First thing Jesus says here is that the Holy Spirit teaches. The Spirit, he says, will teach you all things. So a primary work of the Spirit is to teach us about Jesus. And in my years as pastor, one thing that I've noticed is that many people struggle to really feel like they've had real and substantive encounters and experiences with the Holy Spirit. You know, maybe they've never had a moment of conversion and this this real tangible moment in their lives when Jesus became Lord or Maybe they've heard stories of others who have experienced the supernatural and they've received visions or they've, they've heard the audible voice of God and they wonder why that's never happened for them. And, and if that's you, if, if you've ever felt that way, I hope this is an encouragement to you, this reality that the role of the Spirit is to teach us about Christ. Because what that means for us is this, that if you have any knowledge of Jesus, that if he has ever captured your heart, that if you have ever claimed him as Savior and Lord, then you have experienced, then you have encountered the Spirit in powerful ways, because this is what the Holy Spirit does. You see, we need these words from Jesus because so often we don't even realize the extent to which the Holy Spirit has worked in our lives. We need to remember that it is the Spirit that teaches us the ways of Christ. So the Holy Spirit teaches us. And the second thing Jesus says is that the Spirit reminds. The Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I've said to you. And for broken people like you and me, we we need lots and lots of reminders. And this is exactly what the Holy Spirit does for us. The Spirit reminds us of who we truly are. And I love what the Apostle Paul says about this very thing in Romans chapter 8. Paul writes, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, but rather the Spirit you received brought about your, your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The church, the Holy Spirit reminds us of what is most true about ourselves, that we are children of God, that he has adopted us and then brought us into his household and that we are also co-heirs with Christ. I mean, think for a moment. Think for a moment about how loving and gracious that is, that we have been made co-heirs with Christ that we might share in his glory. This, according to, according to Christ, is a primary work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches and the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are children of God. And thanks be to God, because we, we need constant reminders of such things. Some years back, a poet named Galway Cannell wrote a poem called St. Francis and the So. And in that poem, there's a a beautiful line. I I love this. He writes, Sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness. And there's just so much truth in that line. Sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness. So church, that's a beautiful description of what the Holy Spirit does in us and for us. The Spirit reteaches us our loveliness. The Spirit reminds us of what we too often forget, that we are children of God. So perhaps this is the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life right now. 
that maybe you are in a, a season where you need to be reminded of your own loveliness. And if that's you, then Pentecost, Pentecost is good news. A couple of years ago, I read a book called Tattoos on the Heart, written by a Jesuit priest named Father Greg Boyle. And it's a wonderful book that tells the story of Homeboy Industries, his organization that provides support and hope to previously gang-involved individuals in L.A. And he tells a story about a relationship that he had with a young man named Miguel. Now, Miguel had been abandoned by his family at a very young age. And yet he had this amazing spirit, this spirit of joy and pleasantness about him. And, and Father Greg writes about a conversation he once had with Miguel. And I wanted to share with you some of, some of what he wrote. I give Miguel a ride home after work. I had long been curious about Miguel's own certain resilience. And when we arrive at his apartment, I say, can I ask you a question? How do you do it? I mean, given all that you've been through, all the pain and the stuff you've suffered, how are you like the way you are? I genuinely want to know, and Miguel has his answer at the ready. You know, I always suspected that there was something of goodness in me, but I just couldn't find it. Until one day, he quiets a bit. One day I discovered it here in my heart. I found it. Goodness. And ever since that day, I've always known who I was. He pauses, caught short by his own truth, reteaching loveliness, and turns and looks at me. And now, nothing can touch me. So it was within his own heart that Miguel discovered and remembered his own loveliness. And the truth is because of Pentecost, we can do the same. The good news of Pentecost is this, that God loves and delights in us so much that he even takes up residence within our own hearts. That, how, that is how close the Lord is to his people. The scriptures say that God set his seal of ownership upon us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So friends, God will not be absent from us even for a moment. But rather he comes alongside us and even within us to teach us the ways of Christ and always, always to remind us of our own loveliness. So church, may your soul find rest in the good news of Pentecost. God is with us and will be forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, church, as we conclude our service, I just want to say thank you to those of you who sent in photos for our service today. What a gift and what a joy it is to see your faces today as we celebrate Pentecost. And I'll take with you the, the good news of this day, that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is alongside you and within you. In this day and always, may you know the love of God. May you know the grace and mercy of Jesus our Lord. And may you always know the fellowship of his Holy Spirit. And let all God's people say, Amen.